Aloha everyone, it's Paulina here from Off Grid Hawaii and in today's video we are going to show you an update of our Centropic Citrus Orchard. In this video we're going to share what's been working and what hasn't been working as well as address some of the questions and comments that we got in our previous video. So right now it's spring so the orchard is definitely in need of its spring intervention and we'll show you guys how we do that as well. And definitely stick around for the end of the video because we're going to be doing a really fun experiment where we test out four different fertilizers, three of which are homemade and one which is store-bought. We're going to test these out on some plants that are kind of struggling right now and it's going to be really fun. It's, we're going to have such a good time so definitely stick around and watch the whole video. But before we get into all of that, we do want to address the first question that we've received about the orchard and Michael is going to answer it. Hey guys, Mike here. This first question came just as we were planning out this video, so perfect time. The question is from Heidi Shemp 9965. I'm super interested in seeing if you mapped out the plantings here on paper first. Can you show us the paper plan? Great question. I did plan everything out on paper first, so come on in here and I'm going to show you how I did it. So the first thing I did when I was planning this out is I wrote down all the food crops and mulch crops that I wanted. That's in this column right here. Then in the next column was the time that they'd be in the system. The P is for permanent, that'd be the citrus and things like glaricidia. But then there's other stuff like papaya and banana, they'll only be in the system for part of the time in the beginning. This third column here is the size of all the trees. Now the citrus trees might want to get bigger than 10 feet, but I'm planning on pruning them to 10 feet. I don't want them to get any bigger. They are all dwarf trees, so they shouldn't get too much bigger than that. Um, but this is the room that I allowed them in the orchard. And everything else is kind of like that's the size that they're going to get at their full maturity. This next page here is kind of like just the layout of the trees. This is the size that they would be at their full maturity. Uh, each block equals two feet, so each tree is 10 feet. And then really the only th other thing in this that's on the paper is these, which is the glaricidia, and they've been staggered with the uh, citrus just to give it more room. Uh, very basic on this one here, this design. So this last page here that I'm going to show you is what I predicted everything to look like six months from when I planted it. So the citrus here are still small, the bananas are going to get much bigger. Um, everything underneath, this is like the understory. Same here, this is uh, other row which is uh, mainly for mulch. It's going to have the glaricidia, pigeon pea. There's also going to be some food crops in there. But this is pretty cool because you guys will get to see like what it looks like in real life um, and what I envisioned it would look like when I was planning it out. Um, the main thing is to just see if everything's going to fit and the different layers. So we have kind of like an overstory with these crops and then an understory with um, pineapples. So that's the drawings, what I planned out. Thank you for the question again. I had a really great time answering it. Could have been a much longer video, but you guys probably want to see the orchard, so let's get going. All right, so here we are in the orchard right now, and we're going to address some of those other questions that we had. So if you saw our last video about the orchard, you'll know that we harvested a ton of kabocha pumpkins, and those pumpkins were grown volunteer, and we had a beautiful harvest. We pretty much sold half and like ate half, and right now we just have one tiny pumpkin left that we're probably not even going to eat. but. The question that we got was actually by somebody called Off Grid Neighbors 808, which is actually another YouTuber on the island that whose videos we started watching, which are pretty good. Um, definitely check out his channel, Off Grid underscore Neighbors 808. 
The question goes, do you guys have any issues with pickle worm or blossom rot with the pumpkins? Thanks for the video. You're welcome. And the answer is no, we didn't have any issues with the pickle worm or blossom rot that we noticed up here. We definitely have had it in the past with um, other patches of pumpkins, but it's never been a significant issue for us. We've always been able to have like a good amount of pumpkins growing. Not sure why, but when we've tried growing things like cucumbers and zucchini, we have seen a lot of pickle worm. So they're there, but for some reason the pumpkins that we were growing didn't really get affected by that. And then there was another comment we got, which was kind of funny. It was by Team Cautiously Extreme 8072, who we have met in real life. Hey, <laughs> nice meeting you. And their comment was, super cool guys, great video, but it's killing me. You weren't pulling out the Mimosa Pudica. It is my sworn enemy and I must destroy it. And I wholeheartedly agree because that plant is so annoying and it really, really hurts you. That's the sleepy grass that when you touch, it closes up. So in the last video, we said how we weren't picking out any of the weeds. We were just going to let everything grow. I was telling Michael that we should definitely pick the mimosa because it's awful. He's like, nah, just let it grow. It's all good. But lo and behold, as time went on and we tried uh, getting in here and like actually doing work, intervening in the orchard, the mimosa pudica was just like so annoying and scratching and just getting in the way. So Michael and his mom ended up coming in and like pulling it all out. And yeah, definitely pull that out if you have it growing anywhere where you intend to be growing uh, a garden. Dead. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't want to pull anything out in the beginning, but it was a mistake. In the beds, there was a lot of other weeds, and while I was trying to weed that to, to get more mulch on the ground, every time you stick your hands in, you get pricked by the stuff. and. It doesn't really hurt that much, but it's just really annoying. And so we had to pull it all out of the beds anyway. There's probably some still in the pathways that I didn't get, which I don't really care about because I'm not weeding in there by hand. It's just mowing in the path. What about walking barefoot? So if you want to walk barefoot, <laughs> just watch your step. <laughs> so as for the other weeds here, like the pathway, they get mowed every other week and it's starting to get really thick in here. It's got good grass. I mean, there's a lot of weeds too, but I can just mow everything in here and it works out great. Allows us access to everything else. As you can see, it's really getting thick. The crotalaria is burying our trees. So that's why we're doing an intervention today to see what's on the other side of these crotalarias. So right here we have some of the sugar cane growing. As you can see, it looks beautiful. This variety was given to us by our friend Ashton Combs, who just has a gift with plant propagation. And maybe that's why they're doing great, or maybe it's because we are taking good care of them. And these would be ready to press. Uh, we don't have a juice press though, so if you want to give us one, let us know in the comments. <laughs> Just kidding. Or if you know where we can get a pretty cheap one somewhere, let us know. And we love them. This crotalaria is doing really well. And the only thing we wish we did was put it a little further away from the main crops, the citrus. When I laid out the rows, I did about four foot 
sections and maybe like a foot deep of uh, our soil mix, cinder soil, compost. I intended for them to be two feet away from the citrus trees, but they ended up being like a foot because of the way the soil was, which made them a little bit too close to the citrus. So before these are even at the height where I'd want to cut them, they're already really crowding the citrus. So in the future, when we plant more of this or do more of these projects, we're gonna definitely move the crotillaria out a little bit, two, maybe even three feet from the, the main crops. So this hedgerow would be further away that would allow us access in between the main line and the, the mulch line. And then we could just like work down, chopping and dropping real easy rather than working from this side and then um, going in. So here I am in the row where we planted all the bananas in between some of the citrus trees. And as you can see, they're doing pretty well. And they're about like 15 feet tall right now. Um, we've even gotten some keikis out of these mother clumps and planted them in the other rows as well. And these bananas are here primarily for mulch purposes, but they'll probably start producing a rack of bananas within the next year, which is really awesome because we like to eat bananas, especially with smoothies. So in this spot in the first video, there was a tomato cage here and we had tomatoes. They did really well. We got a lot of tomatoes, which is nice. But now it's taken out. We took that out and we did have ginger planted here and here. That ginger we, we um, harvested and it was really nice to have. It's one of our favorite drinks to make is just like ginger tea. So it was really nice to have our own. So instead of bringing the tomatoes back this year, I took, I harvested the ginger and put one ginger in the middle. Now with the turmeric over there, um, one other thing we found that was maybe a negative is it was planted too close to the citrus tree. And when I harvested it, it was really big clump of turmeric. And I feel like I was, um, you know, messing with the roots of the citrus too much. So I don't think I would plant turmeric as close to the citrus uh, again. So this is a pretty good example of a niche in time where we still have time in between this tree and this tree and the space here. We're gonna hopefully get another nice harvest of ginger right here. I don't feel like it's too close to the citrus. If we're digging around in here, the roots probably won't be here too much yet. Also, if you notice, this is the row that does not have any crotillaria. It just has the county mulch. We do need to add something. So I have planted behind me a row of Mexican sunflower and it's spaced really far off so that I can be walking in between here and then just grabbing the Mexican sunflower, putting it down on this row here. Instead of it being super close, I think it's gonna be much easier to manage. And I might even put another row on the other side. So in the last video, I had a pro tip for you to take all the lemons off. This is another very important thing you must do with grafted trees. See this right here, this sucker, it's uh, below the graft. So what this is, is the rootstock. It's not a lemon. Uh, this, is a <laughs> this is a Meyer lemon, I think, that the, the uh, check mark faded off, but I'm pretty sure it's a Meyer lemon. This right here, however, is not a Meyer lemon. It's a trifoliate. And you can tell by the leaf, it has three leaves there. And all you gotta do, and it's very easy if you catch these before they get out of control, is you just go like this. Pluck it right off. Say goodbye. <laughs> in the last video, we mentioned we were gonna be planting pineapples in our mulch row. Our mulch row consists of Glare City as the long-term crop, but also we put in some papayas and pigeon pea to fill in that space while the Glare City was getting going. We also planted this pineapple in. These other plants are kind of like an overstory, which is going to protect the pineapples from like the really hot midday sun. But in the earlier, like not early morning, but morning and after afternoon, uh, light is going to be able to penetrate in and we can always uh, trim the canopy a little bit to let more light in 
kind of um, we have control over how much the pineapples are getting. In the past, I've seen when you give them full sun, they kind of get bleached out. I know a lot of people grow pineapples in full sun though, but it's a bit of an experiment growing them in a little bit of shade. We've had experience with getting good pineapples that were grown in partial shade. That's what kind of gave me the idea to do this here. But anyway, they all got in. We got about 30 pineapples, mostly white pineapples. There's some yellow ones in here too. Um, also in this row is lemongrass and it's filling in pretty good. It's been helpful to have this as some mulch. Um, we have, you know, these other plants around that give us mulch, but the lemongrass is also a nice one to tuck in there and keep uh, the weeds down, the weed pressure a little bit lower. So the question that's probably in everyone's mind is how are the citrus trees doing? And to answer that, they're not doing amazing. They're not doing terribly, but they're not doing amazing. And what we found is that most of them have been putting out a lot of flowers and like trying to set fruit and they're not really putting out much new growth and more leaves. So right here I have one behind me. This is a Fairchild tangerine. And you can see it's still pretty small, pretty short. Um, it hasn't really had any new leaves since we planted it. And it did try to set some flowers at some point. Um, so what we're thinking is that they need more nitrogen. So today's intervention is definitely gonna involve feeding them more nitrogen rich fertilizers and adding in more of that mulch from the mulch crops. And hopefully that's gonna help out and we'll see some good results in our next update video. What are you mixing? Mixing what we're gonna be feeding the trees. So, I don't know if I wanna tell you guys yet what they are. <laughs> because this is part of the experiment too. Mm -hmm. But basically this is all of the things that we're gonna be using in the experiment later, but to feed all the citrus trees, we're just gonna mix everything together and give them a little bit of everything. I know all of these work and they're all good. The experiments to see which one's better, but for now, we're just gonna feed all the trees a combination of all those things. Looks nice. Write in the comments if you want to guess what they are before we tell you. Yeah, this is one of them. Can you guess what it is? Yes. This is another. Yes. And the other one I did mix in there, it's more chunky, like this. So three things. Is There's there home, homemade? Three homemade fertilizers or plant foods. Are you going to put any store-bought? No. Um, the store-bought stuff is a backup plan in case what we do here doesn't really get the trees going. Then I can go over later. It's, it's a liquid fertilizer and we can just do a drench, soil drench with that later. So that's our backup plan. Alright, well, these trees are hungry. Let's get to work. Mm. Yeah, get a close-up. What is this stuff? What is this? gooey stuff. I'm so hungry. Give it to me. Give it to me. Another thing besides fertilizers that is really going to jumpstart the growth of the citrus trees is what is called a pulse prune. This is when you mechanically prune plants in order to simulate a natural windstorm. This intervention triggers the pruned plants to send carbohydrates and exudates to the ground, thus feeding the microbes, which in turn will make minerals bioavailable to the plants. Also, the pruning is believed to trigger the release of growth hormones that send a signal to the neighboring plants to grow. Link below for more information. So we're just going to take one blue bunny tub worth of our magic mix and spread it around the tree. This way over there, over here. widespread and then we're going to be covering it with the mulch we're getting from the crotalaria 
and anything else that we've been mulching here. So we cleared everything out first just so we can get in there to spread the uh, the mix and then now we're just covering it kind of like a hot dog. We got the bun. <laughs> we got the buns on each side and the center row is where all our food crops are, the citrus, the cassava, the sugarcane, all that. So it's like you get two buns of mulch with your hot dog in the middle. So we just finished up one of our rows of citrus. We don't have enough time to do this video and do everything, so we're gonna get right to the experiment. But before I do that, I just wanted to share the types of tools we use. This is a sickle, and some people call it a rice knife, but this helps out a lot. The one downside is I haven't found a way to carry it conveniently on my body. Maybe I gotta get some kind of holster. Um, but also we got pruners from Felco. These are the cheapest ones they make, but they are really good and we both have a pair, really like them. And the last thing we didn't use much of, but a silky saw. Links to all of this stuff will be in the description if you are curious about them. Maybe you want to pick them up. But yeah, basically pretty much all we use or need most of the time. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, our fertilizer experiment. So our first one here, well let me tell you about what we're going to be fertilizing. About two weeks ago I planted these tree tomatoes and they really haven't greened up. I have some back that are still in pots which I fertilize and they look really green and they grew a little bit. But these ones, I guess I didn't put enough down or maybe, I don't know if I put anything. But they're not looking as good as the ones in pots so we're going to fertilize them with these four. Uh, fertilizers and see which one does the best. First one up, worm castings. These are pretty much pure worm castings. These worm castings came from somewhat of a Johnson Shoe uh, static compost pile. Basically put everything on top and what's coming out from the bottom it just kind of spills out is all these worm castings. It's pretty much made from the Indian blue worms that are not native, but they're, they've been here for a while, established, and also the invasive jumping worms, <gasps> which, <laughs> which I guess aren't too bad here because we're in a subtropical environment. I have not heard anybody really talk about them much until we put out our other video where some people saw them, and that's what got me curious about worms. So I had to do a little research, and I found out they're really bad in some areas but they don't seem to be a problem here but basically the Indian blue worms will go and get the really rich like nitrogen rich food sources and then the Asian jumping worms will come in after and eat you know everything that's um, left over they're more of like carbon eaters and the blue worms are more like nitrogen eaters anyway so we got here basically two cups of worm castings and I'm just going to sprinkle it around like so. Later on we're going to come through and put mulch on top of everything. We're not going to just leave this exposed. It's going to seal it in there and help it to last longer. Also protect it from getting washed away in the rain because it's been raining quite a bit. So next one up here is a fertilizer I make using chicken manure and biochar. I don't want to get too much into detail about this because we plan on making a video. This is what I think is our most powerful homemade fertilizer. So video about this is coming up but basically it's chicken manure and biochar and it's pretty strong. So this one may be the winner. We don't know. We don't know. Same amount I'm using, just filled it up halfway in 16 ounces or two cups. Definitely, it has a uh, chicken manure smell. Next up is one you guys might know of. We made a video about this. 
The only difference is this has been made in a dry environment. So this is our urine mulch fertilizer. The one you saw in the video, that's been out in the elements. It gets wet. It's not as strong as when you keep it dry. So if you just use the urine and dry mulch and keep it covered, it's a lot stronger. So that's what we have here. Same amount as the other ones. <laughs> Same thing here, 16 ounces of urine mulch. Oh. So for this one, I'm going to put a little bit of mulch down first. Because this one is a liquid fertilizer. And this is something that I have brought plants and trees back from the dead just by using this, you know, like I think trees are about to die. You use this and they come back to life. They grow leaves. So what it is, is a combination of fish hydrolysate and kelp, liquid kelp. So I used probably a tablespoon of fish hydrolysate and maybe the same of the kelp. And actually, <laughs> it smells a little bit like what was in here. It was, what was it, blueberry, cranberry elderberry, juice. cranberry juice. <laughs> but also smells strong like fish and kelp. So we're just gonna do a similar thing around. And then cover that with more mulch. I smell it. I smell it. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right guys the sun is setting and we need to close out the video so thank you so much for watching all the way through and definitely let us know down in the comments if you have any questions or anything you'd like to see in our next update video which will most likely be in the summertime and in the meantime don't forget to like share and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this from us in the future it really really helps us feel happy <laughs> all right bye <laughs>